Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, the 31st of May. I'm Laura Cornfield, and this is IBA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. Well, as of noon today, the country has a new defense minister, Avigdor Lieberman. Here in the studio to discuss the latest developments is IBA's political correspondent, Kalev Ben David. Kalev? Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman was greeted on the first day of his new job with a ceremony of military pomp and circumstance at IDF headquarters in Tel Aviv. This was followed by his first official meeting with Chief of Staff Gadi Eisenkot and later with the IDF General Staff. Lieberman's appointment was finally approved last night with a Knesset vote of 55 to 43 after a stormy debate in which Zionist Union MK Mickey Rosenthal called him a violent and racist person. Likud MK Benny Begin broke party ranks and abstained in the vote. Yisro Beitenu's Sofa Landver was also approved as new immigration absorption minister and Likud MK Tzachi Hanegbi was promoted to minister without portfolio. At his swearing-in ceremony, Lieberman sought to soothe concerns over his hardline image, saying he supported a two-state solution with the Palestinians, welcomed the call by Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi for a new peace effort, and said he even saw positive aspects to the Saudi peace initiative that Israel has until now rejected. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his government will continue to pursue responsible, balanced, and aggressive security policies, while also offering his most positive, positive words yet about the Saudi peace plan. We take this uh, opportunity to make clear that I remain committed to making peace with the Palestinians and with all our neighbors. The Arab uh, Peace Initiative includes positive elements that can help revive constructive negotiations with the Palestinians. We are willing to uh, negotiate with the Arab states revisions to that initiative so that ref it reflects the dramatic changes in the region since 2002, but maintains the agreed goal of two states for two peoples. To this end, we welcome the recent speech by Egyptian President uh, Assisi and his offer to help advance peace and security in the region. At the cabinet's first meeting with a broader 66-member coalition, I asked Energy Minister Yuval Steinitz if a government viewed as one of the most hard line in Israel's history really saw an opportunity to push forward toward a regional peace agreement. Generally speaking, uh, in the Arab world and the Muslim world, more and more leaders uh, are willing to realize, to recognize that Israel is a very important country that helped to fight terrorism and to stabilize the region. And if we can uh, uh, use this in order to give another uh, chance for the peace process uh, with the backing of the Arab and uh, Muslim world, with the understanding that Israel should be recognized and legitimized, uh, this is something that uh, uh, we shall uh, try. To do. In the coming months, the new coalition will have to deal with a number of sensitive diplomatic and security issues, including the French peace conference and the negotiations over a new military aid package from the U.S. And one voice certain to be heard loud and clear on these matters is Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman. Laura? Kalev, how serious are Netanyahu and Lieberman about pursuing the possibility of reviving the peace process via the Saudi initiative they have rejected until now? Well, there is no question that they are serious about a, some kind of regional peace initiative. Both uh, Netanyahu and Lieberman have said repeatedly that they see an opening uh, with the uh, so-called moderate Sunni Arab states because of the common front that they have with Israel against the Iranian threat. And they're hoping these countries will be more sympathetic to Israel's positions. There is a problem, though, with the Saudi Peace Initiative, which calls for Israel to return back to the 1967 borders. And the prime minister has been very firm in not wanting to see any kind of uh, uh, statement that calls on Israel, even as a, as a basis for negotiation, to go back to the 1967 border. So that is a real stumbling block. Kalev, and if they do pursue the Saudi Peace, peace Initiative, what kind of impact is that likely to have on the coalition after the addition of Israel Beitenu? 
Well, that's another problem because if he, if Netanyahu should make that leap forward and accept some kind of formulation with 1967 borders as a basis for negotiation, it's very likely that the Jewish Home Party headed by Naftali Bennett would bolt the government. And uh, Lieberman is only now bringing in five seats into the coalition. That's not enough to cover the loss of Jewish Home leaving the government. Uh, in that case, one possibility, we know the prime minister is keeping the foreign ministry open for Isaac Herzog. He may yet try again to bring in the Zionist Union Party. And he mentioned that last night. But we'll have to see. That is still an unlikely scenario at this stage. Thanks for that update, Kalev. Pleasure. The 19-year-old soldier who was lightly injured in yesterday's stabbing attack in Tel Aviv has been released from hospital. The soldier was attacked on the city's Igal Alon Street by a teenage Palestinian terrorist who stabbed him in the head with a screwdriver. The terrorist, identified as Omar al Abushi from the West Bank village of Salfit, was arrested shortly after the attack. He fled the nearby apartment buildings where civilians, including a local reality TV star who happened to be in the area filming a TV show, cornered him in one of the buildings until police detained him. Prior to the attack, El Abushi wrote on his Facebook page that he wanted to be a martyr. A short time from now, the Israeli mission at the United Nations will host a conference against the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement at the UN headquarters in New York. IBA's Elon Aslan Levy has this report. The BDS movement continues to make strides in their campaign to delegitimize the state of Israel. A spokesman for the boycott movement? No. This is according to the Israeli mission at the UN. Today it is hosting an international summit of student leaders and Jewish communal organizations in New York with the stated aim of forming a concerted plan of action against efforts to delegitimize the Jewish state. The conference, organized in partnership with the World Jewish Congress, Anti-Defamation League and other Jewish organizations, will hold its opening plenary session in the iconic UN General Assembly Hall with panel discussions and a speech by Israeli Supreme Court Justice Eliakim Rubinstein. I think it's incredible that we have the support of the Israeli government um, behind you know, the American student body uh, that tries to defend Israel every week, every day really, um, against the delegitimization and the need or the advocation of boycott, divestment and sanctioning of Israel. The summit will also include a musical performance by reggae star Mattis Yao in the General Assembly Hall itself. Last year, Mattis Yao made headlines performing at a Spanish music festival, successfully demanding that organizers reverse their earlier decision to revoke the invitation of the Jewish American singer under pressure from boycott activists. Danny Danone, Israel's permanent representative to the World Assembly, called BDS the modern incarnation of anti-Semitism. The conference, he said, will send a clear message to all of our adversaries. Israel will not relent and will continue to reveal the lies propagated by the BDS movement. Israel's efforts to battle the boycott movement came under fire earlier this month in the State Controller's report, which criticized the decision to move the brief out of the foreign ministry and into the small but expanding Ministry of Strategic Affairs. The report recommended that Israel's security cabinet itself evaluate and periodically assess Israel's efforts on this front. The World Jewish Congress has called for Israel to bring the fight to BDS's doorstep. But unless Israel is able to harmonize between competing agencies and ministries, that fight is going to struggle to progress beyond the doorstep of the General Assembly Hall. This is Elon Aslan Levy for IBA News. A reconciliation agreement with Turkey is very close. This according to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who told a delegation of visiting U.S. congressmen that he is highly optimistic that ties between the two countries will soon be normalized. Negotiating teams from Israel and Turkey are due to convene in Europe next week in an effort to seal an agreement to restore ties between Jerusalem and Ankara. Relations deteriorated following the Israeli commando raid on the Turkish Mavi Marmara ship in May of 2010, in which nine Turkish civilians were killed. Israeli forces sought to prevent the ship from entering Gaza waters and encountered severe violence on board. Under pressure from U.S. President Barack Obama, Netanyahu apologized to Turkey over the incident and last year, Israel agreed to pay compensation to the families of those killed in the raid. Talks between the sides are stalled over Turkey's insistence that Israel lift what it describes as a blockade on Gaza and allow in an uninterrupted flow of goods. Incitement against Israel has taken top priority inside Hamas-run Gaza, 
where young children are taught to hate the Jewish state from an early age. At a recent elementary school play broadcast on Hamas television, Palestinian children, apparently less than 10 years old, are shown wearing army uniforms and armed with toy weapons and rocket launchers as they attack Israeli soldiers. During the play, one of the children places a mock mine underneath a model of an Israeli tank and waits for it to blow up. Other school plays broadcast on television in recent weeks show Palestinian children acting out stabbing and shooting attacks on Israeli soldiers and civilians and the capture of an Israeli soldier. Joining me now in the studio is Itamar Marcus, director and founder of the Palestinian Media Watch, an Israeli research institution that studies and analyzes Palestinian society by monitoring its media and school books. Thank you so much for joining us, Itamar. Thank you for inviting me. Following a period of relative quiet, once again last night there was a stabbing attack carried out by a young teenage Palestinian who claimed he wanted to be a martyr. How do you explain this motivation and how much of it is really a result of continuous uh, anti-Israel incitement? Well, what's uh, actually very striking is that uh, there has been a significant drop uh, in Palestinian uh, terror in the last month and a half, two months. And that corresponds to a significant drop on Palestinian television in its own particular incitement against Israel. We were translating dozens of items a day during the six months of, of terror. Uh, intense incitement by the Palestinians, and I'm talking about Palestinian Authority now, not uh, and Fatah, not, not Hamas. Uh, they were, as far as we saw, they were leading it, they were giving the signals. The individuals were responding, the individual social media also copycatted, but uh, when the PA decided that terror was no longer in its interest, they actually cut down the incitement and we've had this drop in terror is absolutely corresponds to the drop in incitement. So how big a role do you think the Palestinian media plays in the ongoing incitement? The Palestinian media plays a major role in the incitement. The Palestinian Authority has many ways to signal to its people that it's interested in having violence at a particular period. Uh, this we saw before, uh, in, again, in the last six months. Uh, it's not just the media is one of the means. When we see it active in the media, we know that it's also coming from other directions as well. This item that you showed now on um, on Hamas, uh, the, it actually was Islamic Jihad. It was Islamic Jihad children. They were dressed up as Islamic Jihad uh, uniforms. Uh, this particular item, we have seen similar things in recent weeks coming from the Palestinian Authority, coming from Fatah, two Palestinian Authority schools uh, in the West Bank recently had similar uh, events for children. One of them had children dressed up um, as uh, as fighters and they had an Israeli soldier and we're probably talking about kindergarten age children as well and they had a child dressed up as an Israeli soldier holding his hands up in surrender and then in the next picture what do we see the Israeli soldier is shot, shot dead and the boy with the plastic gun is smiling so there in this particular Palestinian Authority school children were taught to see themselves as potentially killing and then in a Palestinian Authority high school next to Tekoa uh, the, uh, they had a different type of play. These were, they had actors acting at a play in which they showed Israeli soldiers, again, actors, uh, capturing a Palestinian, lying him down on the floor, and then placing a knife next to him and then shooting him. And this is part of the Palestinian Authority libel that most of the stabbers were actually innocent victims of Israel, uh, and then Israel placed the knives. So if you take these two messages coming from PA schools, Palestinian Authority schools, one is that Israelis are killing them in cold blood, which creates the hatred. And the second message, even at the kindergarten level, is your job, therefore, is to kill Israelis. Uh, Itamar, do you agree with the assessment that's given by some top IDF officials that this so-called lone wolf trend is not only related to ideology, but perhaps the result of despair and frustration? The Palestinian Authority on four different occasions, twice under Abbas and twice under Yasser Arafat, used the argument about Jerusalem to spark violence. It was in 2014, October, uh, Abbas used it. Abbas, uh, Arafat uses to to spark the Intifada in 2000. Uh, so what we've seen is consistently, consistently, the Palestinian Authority leadership uses the argument of Jerusalem. And now the Palestinian population is a very religious population. When you come and you tell them repeatedly that the Jews are defiling Al-Aqsa, Jews are planning to destroy Al-Aqsa, uh, that's, that's what this is all about. All of the statements from the original attackers 
all had to do with Jerusalem, Al-Aqsa, defending Al-Aqsa. So later on, and this was fascinating, later on when the international community started complaining to Israel about Palestinian frustration, it was only then that the Palestinians themselves started talking about frustration. This was all about Jerusalem from the beginning. That was the spark, that's what made it, that was the driving uh, force. And today, when the PA has accomplished politically what it wanted by this violence, they've raised the Palestinian issue, they've got a French initiative now, they no longer needed the violence. That was why they essentially called it off, and that's why we see the, the stop in violence. Itamar, this Friday, foreign ministers from some of the world's most powerful countries, along with a few from Arab countries as well, will convene in Paris <clears throat> to discuss the renewal of peace talks between Israel and the PA. Netanyahu has repeatedly rejected the French initiative, saying it evades uh, direct talks. How should Israel brace for this event? Israel should brace by showing items like the ones I described, showing that the Palestinian Authority has not yet proven itself to be an interested peace partner. Uh, when kindergarten children in the school system are taught to, to kill Israelis, uh, when, uh, when children's programming regularly that's controlled by the PA is teaching children that Jews are monkeys and pigs, uh, when they're demonizing that Israeli soldiers are, are killing them on purpose, uh, there's no peace partner on the other side yet. When we see a change in the way the Palestinian Authority is educating their people, and I don't mean they should accept Zionism, I mean they should argue the issues with their, with their people, not demonize us, argue the issues that are on the table. When we see that, then we'll know we have a peace partner. As long as Jews are being presented as monkeys and pigs to children, we don't have a peace partner yet. Will it give the Palestinians further legitimization to, to demand more concessions? It depends on how Israel responds. If Israel responds and says, don't go, don't talk, don't, 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 uh, then it's going to be a disaster for Israel. If Israel goes and say, and, and focuses on peace education, focuses on the hate education of the Palestinian Authority, focuses on what, what has to be done to have a generation of Palestinians who will live in peace with Israel. If we focus on the building peace that the Palestinian Authority is prohibiting, then I think we, it will not be a disaster. We can actually accomplish something. Itamar Marcus from the Palestinian Media Watch. Always great to have you with us. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Former Labor Party leader and presidential candidate Benjamin Ben Eliezer has been offered a plea bargain in the bribery trial he is facing. The 80-year-old former lawmaker was reportedly told he could avoid jail time in exchange for an 11 million shekel fine. However, Ben Eliezer has apparently rejected the offer, saying he does not have the necessary funds to meet that request. The former defense minister is accused of receiving more than 2 million shekels from businessmen in exchange for decisions he made as a public servant. He allegedly hid large sums of money from tax authorities and violated transparency rules for Knesset members. Ben Eliezer suffers from deteriorating health and according to local media reports, the prosecution is considering dropping bribery charges against the former lawmaker in order to enable a no prison deal. No Tobacco Day was marked around the globe today and this year the World Health Organization is calling on international governments to enact policies for plain packaging of tobacco products. Here at home the Health Ministry issued its own report on the status of smokers in Israel. According to the figures, an estimated 20% of the local adult population are smokers. Of those inhaling, 26% are men, that's almost double the number of women who smoke. An estimated 7,500 Israelis died last year from smoke-related illnesses, almost 800 of whom died from secondhand smoke. However, there is something positive. The report shows that overall the habit is on the decline, pointing to a significant drop in the number of teenage smokers and soldiers over the past decade. Drivers out there, pay attention. The price of gasoline will rise at midnight tonight by nearly 3%. That's an extra 16 agro per liter at the self-service line. The price of 95 octane will stand at 6.01 shekels per liter. The hike is attributed to a sharp rise in oil prices worldwide, which have gone up by 9% over the past month and 25% since the start of the year. In local money matters, shares were up on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange while the shekel was mixed in foreign currency trading. Here are the numbers. Turning the forecast and temperatures will continue to rise with unseasonably high in the inland and mountainous regions. Here are the highs and lows at home and abroad for the next 24 hours.
And that's all for this newscast. Please join us again tomorrow, same time, same channel. I'm Laura Cornfield wishing you a good evening and shalom from Jerusalem.